Um, on behalf of Julesy and myself, thank you everyone for being here. Um, we, we truly appreciate the time you're taking to be with us today. Um, I think we'd like to hand it over to Dr. Khan first to explain um, the basis of this, um, explain a bit more about the ASM Fellowship. Great, thank you, Jaywan. Welcome everybody. My name is Faria Khan and I'm the Associate Director for Asian American Studies here at Penn. Um, and I'm honored to welcome our esteemed guests and all of you to the first of three ASM Fellow Symposia in a series entitled The Foreign Body. I do want to just take a moment though before we begin and just to acknowledge and honor the lives that we have lost um, in Atlanta and the struggles that we are facing as Asian Americans. I do want to um, just briefly acknowledge and honor that um, as we begin this conference um, on Asian American lives. So this is the first year Asian American Studies launched the ASM Fellowship. Our six amazing fellows spent the summer of 2020 con conducting independent research projects ranging from healthcare to the census to science fiction, as well as examining issues concerning incarceration, mental health, and education. This past fall, each fellow presented their work in this spring, work closely with each other to organize these three symposia that will engage how the state and greater geopolitical forces have politicized and controlled the foreign body, the Asian American body. I'm so proud of the work each fellow has accomplished and the ways in which they have navigated and persevered conducting research in a pandemic. I'll turn this back over now to our fellows, Jolsi Ariza and Jaywan Kim. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Khan, for the introduction. So to preface, this event is inspired by my research this summer on how COVID-19 has revealed systemic issues in the Philadelphia School District and Jaywan's research on how community leaders have adapted to market the 2020 census to Asian Americans. To elaborate more on this very important intersection of our work, we are moderating a discussion on the realities of advocating for Asian Americans from the perspective of local policymakers and people and stakeholders invested um, in education policy in Philadelphia. Specifically, this conversation will examine the issues of the census and Philadelphia public schools to explore what it will take for the Asian American community to receive the services that it deserves. Thanks, Jolsi. Um, and before we start, We'd also, again, like to take a moment to acknowledge the events of this week and to read aloud the ASM program statement. Uh, the devastating shootings in Atlanta follow a dramatic rise in attacks against Asian Americans, as well as a much longer history of anti-Asian attacks in this country. Anti-Asian racism was part of the campaign for managing this pandemic at the highest levels of our government and it has resulted in murderous violence against the most vulnerable members of our community. Asian Americans have always been treated as the alien other, never fully incorporated into our history books and denied humanization in this country. The title of our series, The Foreign Body, is a reflection of this fact. Racism inculcated as the, at the highest levels must be fought at every level. The Asian American Studies program was created out of an activist call to defend our community, and we are committed to exposing the history, structure, and culture of anti-Asian racism in America, and most importantly, to demonstrate the power of solidarity. With that, we would like to thank all of you for coming out today and spend time to spend time to be with us. And especially we would love to thank our lovely speakers for sharing their thoughts and stories with us. And before we begin, we'd like to read through some of um, their bios just to give a brief introduction as to who they are. So first off, we have Dan Poe who is the principal of Horace Howard Furness High School in South Philadelphia. He has worked for the School District of Philadelphia for 25 years. He's a longtime Philadelphia resident and educator who has seen how important education and representation is for Asian American communities. Thank you for that. And thanks for inviting me. I have the honor of introducing Stephanie Sun, who is appointed the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Governor's Advisory Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs in June 2020. 
Prior to joining the office of the governor, Tom Wolf, Sun served as the Associate Director of Partnerships, Philly Counts, for the City of Philadelphia, responsible for developing engagement strategies with diverse communities to promote participation in the 2020 U.S. Census. In 2020, she was also assigned to work on COVID-19 and the election. Sun worked for government diplomatic agencies in both China and South Korea, and for three Fortune 120 international corporations in three countries, China, South Korea, and the United States. She also has experience in corporate philanthropy as a grant analyst working on both international and domestic grants, and has also written grant applications. She previously worked as the marketing manager for the Greater China Region for SK Group, a global Fortune 100 company with a staff of 400 salespeople reporting to her through their sales managers. Sun is a journalist and served as the senior director of the main local Chinese language newspaper based in Philadelphia, informing and being a voice for the immigrant community and serving as an advocate for grassroots and marginalized people. In 2016, Sun collaborated with Philadelphia City Council to organize the first ever city council public, city council public hearing concerning the Asian Pacific American community in the history of Philadelphia. And she is constantly advocating for the rights of crime victims in the APA community and facilitating their interaction with law enforcement. And our third panelist. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our third panelist is the wonderful council member, Helen Gim. Seated in 2016, council member Helen, Helen Gim is a longtime educator and community organizer and the first Asian American woman elected to Philadelphia city council. Before coming on to city council, she was one of the city's most visible organizers, helping to establish Philadelphia as a sanctuary city, fighting off a stadium and casino in Chinatown, and leading a broad-based coalition to fight the state takeover of the Philadelphia public schools. She led the protest of the Muslim ban at the airport and has been a staunch advocate for ending inhumane detention and deportation practices against immigrant communities. Since coming into office, she has led a human rights agenda rooted in housing, education, and racial economic justice. She established a legal defense fund for renters facing eviction and immigrant residents fighting deportation. She established groundbreaking legislation such as the nation's first anti-retaliation law on health orders, mandatory advanced scheduling for hospitality and retail workers, and the city's first civil Gideon effort, a law guaranteeing right to counsel in landlord-tenant court for low-income residents. She's co-chair of Local Progress, a national network of progressive local electeds where she leads immigrant rights and economic justice efforts. Wow. Thank you. So yes, thank you all three of you so much for being here today. All of you, just from your bios, we can tell that you are amazing people who have done so much. Um, so we are really excited to speak with you today. Great. Glad to be here. Thank you. So the way that this is going to work um, is that we are going to bring up some of our questions that we've written for you all um, for the first part, and then we're going to later open it up for public Q&A um, at the end. Um, and then after that, we're also planning on having an email blast activity for about like the last half hour. So that's just preparation for everyone to know what we are going to be doing today. Yeah, and we will also have some time for the public to ask some questions. So we encourage you to either send this in the, in the chat or um, go ahead and unmute yourselves at the end when we have that space. So take it away, you'll see with the first question. Great. So our first question is, there are very few Asian Americans involved with Philadelphia politics. The only Asian American on the school board recently stepped down. We ask Mrs. Sun, um, what was your experience trying to call for recognition of these communities? And Council, Mayor, Council Member Gim, if you could weigh in as well. And to all of you, how do you think more representation of Asian Americans could improve experiences in Philly schools? Let's start with um, Stephanie Sun. Thank you so much. And first, I want to say thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Khan, J1, and Josie. I really appreciate the UPenn Asian American Study Program and ASEAN Fellows organizing this very important panel discussion and providing the opportunity to meet with the fellows and students, alumni, and be with such two phenomenal panelists, Councilmember Kim and Principal Paul. 
which is also a member of our commission. It's my great, great honor. Thank you so much. Um, and also thank you uh, for the question. Um, uh, to your first question about what my experience like trying to call for recognition of this, of our communities, uh, there are two feelings actually always come up on the top of my mind. One is, oh, fortunately, I am here at the table. And the second is, oh, we need to bring more Asian Pacific Americans to the table. I think many Asian Pacific Americans who work in the public sector may also share the same feeling. We often find ourselves the only Asian Pacific face at the table in the room. So I always ask myself how I can maximally affect this precious position. So, um, yeah, and also to call for recognition of our community. Often I feel fortunately I'm here and at the table so I can be the voice of our community to question this, to suggest that, to point out issues, point out needs, challenges, and even complaints in our community and on the ground. But, but and, and also to make changes before some policies or program or plans go out to the public or be implemented. We're the voices and the advocate for our community, but also the educator and the reminders to to educate the system and the decision makers about our community and to take every opportunity again and again to remind them of the needs and the contributions of APA community and what is the appropriate and efficient way to serve our community. And then as I said that, then right after that, always the second thought came to my mind is always, oh, what if I were not here at this table and how many tables where decisions are made have even no one single Asian Pacific American at the table. This always worries me and drives me to work hard every day and drives me to every day to think about how to build a pipeline and, and uh, how to increase the representation of Asian Pacific Americans in the government and at the tables where decisions are made in all industry and every day to look for opportunities and create op opportunities to bring more Asian Pacific American community members to the table, to the circles and to the positions. So, but also I remind myself, I should think, uh, see the things in positive way. So the positive part is that it means that um, we're entering some fields or circles that are still relatively new for our community. So um, we are the beginner and we have the chance and channel to bring more of our people into the circle. And the uh, entry opportunity gives us the channel to bring uh, more opportunity and manpower um, opportunities and to our community members. Um, to your second question, how I think um, more representation of Asian American will improve the experience in Philly schools. I think increase of the representation in the faculty and the staff would definitely help a lot. What representation brings so far is far more, how to say, uh, what representation brings is far more than just the language access, but also the um, it will also naturally bring the knowledge of the community that can be, uh, that cannot be read in books, such as the cultural competence, the access and the ability to communicate efficiently with the students, parents, and the member of this specific communities and bring the information of needs and challenges from them back to the school working groups to advise and help schools to improve the service and experience in school. And given the Asian population as around 7.2% in Philadelphia and with a fast, um, as the fastest growing um, population in this country and also in this um, area, 
including the fast growing Asian students population, the Asian American faculty and staff in my eyes is far from enough. Um, we are honored to have Prince Dan Paul as the only and first Cambodian American principal in the whole country. And we also are so lucky and honored to have our council member again as the first Asian councilwoman, one of the two, only two Asian council member in Philadelphia. And the real, and we all know she's also the real fighter for education and for school and for students. But this is far from enough and we still need more and way more. And on the top of that, many Asian Pacific students are from recent immigrant families with language barrier. So many Asian Pacific students share that their first several years in the school when they arrive here, they're, they're very lost and isolated and frustrated. They sit in the class day and day, by uh, hours by hours, but cannot understand what the teachers is teaching in English on the stage at all. And with the language barriers, they're also not able to communicate with their classmates and faculties. This creates social isolation and mental health issues, hurting the students, both academic growth and also the mental growth and also hurt their, um, their families. So if these students can have faculty or school staff speaking their own languages, and understand their own culture, thinking in the similar way of them and spend enough time in communicating with them and supporting them. I believe the experience in school can be obviously improved. And Councilwoman Kin and uh, Principal uh, Paul are both the experts in the school education field and know better than me. I'm very excited to hear their insight. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for just a lovely opening, um, especially acknowledging uh, the uh, the Penn Asian American Studies program, the work of Professor Khan, Jaywan, and Jelsey, and and uh, this moment that we have together. Um, you know, I think what happened uh, this week in Georgia is very much relevant to some of our conversations about both visibility and voice, and then understanding the ways in which. Um, people are, you know, the, the true challenges and, and sometimes even violence that people have, young people have faced uh, in pursuit of their education um, and in pursuit of their livelihood. So um, I will, so I'm Helen Gim, city council member, and then uh, I think th the work that I have mostly spent uh, touches upon a little bit of what Stephanie has said, which is to prepare people to come into a space of uh, visibility, to find your voice, um, to come into spaces of civic engagement. And that actually starts with building out your capacity to do it and your belief that if you do engage, things actually do change. Oftentimes in my work, um, working especially around the many challenging issues of the Philadelphia public school system, one of the most overwhelming and difficult problems we have is the belief that things don't change, even if you take action. And so um, we always are working with young people through leadership development programs, through short-term campaigns and long-term campaigns uh, for justice um, to surround young people with other like-minded young Asian Americans who are excited, creative, um, who feel like their participation fulfills like personal like ambitions and gives them opportunity as well as like a wonderful, like happy, fulfilling experience of friendship, camaraderie, like lesson learning. Um, so I feel very strongly about if we want to see more, more people in, um, in, in the civic spaces that, that you may see here in this small panel, then we need to really invest in the vehicles that prepare young people for leadership, for opportunity, and for change making. Um, and uh, most of that work for me personally has been on the ground within communities. Oftentimes, as has been said before, Asian Americans often aren't welcomed into a lot of other spaces, so we do create them. 
And I think here in the city of Philadelphia, you will find a lot of vibrant uh, community uh, organizing groups that have a strong, active, moral, vocal presence of Asian American young people in them. Um, and I urge you to go out and find those. Um, you know, I'm, I can spend some time rattling them off, but it, you know, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't find your own home. And so that's where I would start that um, young people right now who are wondering like, what was, what's your path to where you, uh, to where you are today? I mean, mine came through community, came through organizations that had a really strong Asian American presence where I felt like um, not only that uh, my leadership is validated, which is, you know, very self-oriented, but more expansively, like I was learning so much from other people and expanding my understanding of language and of how institutions work in good ways and in nefarious ways. And so we really need to spend the time on our own capacity on our own development. That's why Penn Asian American Studies matters. That's why finding a home for Asian Americans matters at Penn in particular. And continuing to demand and carve out that space, including the resources that are necessary for it, has all of our support um, and is gonna be uh, one of the most important things that, that you can do even in your short time at Penn. Um, second, I think the question was uh, what, what should be different? You know, what does representation mean in this era? And I think, you know, for me, a lot of the work that I do is working with um, young people uh, who are, um, and families and communities who are here in Philadelphia, that means they're more likely to be recent immigrant, they're more likely um, to go to public education, public schooling, they're more likely uh, to be in um, lower wage jobs. And so my work is around that. And I do hope that my presence in a political structure is not just about interchanging like new faces in, a, in the same political hierarchy. Fundamentally, your presence within any institution should alter the trajectory of that institution going a traditional path of, you know, patriarchy or whiteness or, um, you know, uh, you know, of, of margin, you know, marginalizing the voices of people um, who, who really matter. In public schools, uh, the way this matters is that the presence of Asian Americans should not mean that we become the faces of, of, of say, tearing down affirmative action. We should not be the faces of tiger moms that promote the model minority stereotypes and mythologies that bring um, or fail to bring resources to young people in our public schools. We should not be the faces of special admission schools for a narrow section of young people when the majority of Asian Americans are in our larger public school system, including Principal Poe's and many other elementary and small schools. So we must be invested in a bigger vision of education justice than this small sector of things that so often Asian Americans are penned as. And we should not be the faces of people who tell other immigrants, recent immigrants, um, to get to the back of the line, you know, to say that it's not your space, it's not your time. We should instead be welcoming of the diversity of the Asian American experience, which is absolutely present. We should be welcoming and inclusive of taking down patriarchy, uplifting women's voices, in particular young women's voices. Um, we should be uh, cognizant of the diversity amongst religion, um, ethnicity, language, and then dedicate ourselves that our presence will make sure that that becomes uh, broader, more inclusive, more possible than ever before. So it's not such that we are Asian Americans um, who are in power, but we are Asian Americans who learn how to share power, broaden it, and then make space for those to follow. That's awesome, thank you. Um, to start with, let me just start by saying thank you for inviting me here. I am super, super honored to be among the other two panelists who are um, the powerhouse of Philadelphia pretty much. Uh, I am 
classify as a humble servant inside a school building. But in any case, let me just start by saying that um, representation matters. You know, when I grew up, I grew up, I came here um, as a refugee. There was no one that I could look up to. The people of my generation look up to. Um, I came into to education by accident because of the fact that I fell in love when I volunteer. And then I realized that, you know what, our students have no one to look up to. Uh, so having, sorry, that was not the train station, that's my bell. Um, having, having representation uh, matters a whole lot for our population, especially with a population like uh, Furness, we have people from 30 different countries spoken uh, many, many languages, um, especially brand new to this country, they don't know where to go, what to do, or how to reach for um, resources. See, not knowing the different resources available out there limits you, limits you from uh, growing as a person to this new country. But having representation um, give you that opportunity to see that, you know what, the sky is the limit. I can do this, I will do this, and I can reach far. And I often tell this to my students, if I come to this country, when I, I was a refugee, child didn't speak a word of English, if I can make it this far, guess what? You can too, and you can, you can go farther. So the first step we need to do is, uh, as an Asian, we need to break down. There are also many types of Asian, the model Asian, and there are Asian who are from separate part of the world that are not being represented. When they see representation, um, they are inspired to move on to their career path. They can make a big difference for our city's economy in the future, building workforce. And um, so I believe here uh, that we need to continue to promoting uh, pushing for acknowledgement, uh, advocating for Asian American, um, providing different services, not only just to the students, but also to the parents. Reach out to them. Everyone has a part in that, uh, not just the teachers, the social worker, everybody, meaning uh, myself, you, uh, mm -hmm. Councilman, Councilwoman Gim and Stephanie and people from Penn. So continue pushing and pushing because representation matter because it will manifest itself to a lot of different ways and ways that we we need to be represented and our children need to see that they are here and they are being supported. Thank you so much. Um, and like Principal Po said, our next question is about how representation absolutely matters. And one of those tools we've seen to gain recognition and representation politically and financially is the 2020 census, which was important for Black, Indigenous, person of color communities. Um, and we actually saw mass mobilization among Asian American organizations to get people counted, in large part, thank you to um, Philly Counts Work and numerous other organizations. So our question is, how do you all find buy-in from the Asian American community in all these issues that you've mentioned? I think um, and about, yeah, if anyone wants to. Okay, I think it's about education. If we teach them, if we show them that they matter, everyone matters, and they are part of the society. They're not just here as a number. They're not just here just to collect um, welfare check, they start to speak out. We start to speak out. So education matters a lot. I continue working with the grassroots organization, continue working with our city government, continue working at the school level. So um, that's my point right there. Yes, I second. Um Principal poll is, um, yeah, is 
basically very important part for us to in, uh, for us uh, we need to invest our effort to do the civic education for our community through my work i think uh, there are multiple reasons why api community are undercounted but the majority one is still the how to say the understanding the awareness of the census even what a census and how the census is impacting their their everyday life. So um, right before I start my work, um, more than one year ago, I read some data. Almost all the data uh, was the how to say survey among all different communities indicates that no matter in the terms of the the awareness census or the likeness to fill out the census or the barriers to fill out the census. Um, our community, AEPI community, is has been always in the bottom, unfortunately. And so, yes, there are many barriers we need to fight and work to overcome it, especially the language barriers. Like in Pennsylvania, more than 78% of AEPI residents speak another language than English. And uh, we all know that uh, we, AEPI community, is the only community uh, with the majority as immigrant, which means foreign born. So with those language and also cultural difference, but also like um, principal um, Pro said that the key is education. And we all know education cannot happen uh, like or finish in one month and the change cannot be made in one, one night. It takes time. It takes even the patience to talk to one, to one by one to tell them and help our community to understand and build the link between the census and their everyday life, between the census and, the, and their needs and their hope and their right and the things they're complaining about. Um, yeah, so we have a very long, long time to go. And, but as I mentioned that I always in, remind myself to look at the things in the positive way. So even though I have been heard that, okay, um, a API community is the hardest community to be count. Even many comments say that our community is the hardest community to access to and to engage. But at least as the MC just mentioned that we, our community did try our best in um, on the 2020 census, especially in the Philadelphia area, uh, we did try our best to create a huge and diverse coalition. We bring more than 100 community um, leaders from diverse community together to form the API subcommittee. And we meet monthly and every week, we averagely have 10 census events happen in different regions across Philadelphia and also in different community. But it's always not enough and never be enough. But at least I see the difference comparing my interaction with the community at the beginning when I just start the work and, and the end. So through that almost one year period of the time, at least that um, I see the change in our community that many community members, at least they know what is census when you're talking about. Um, as I, and I share that, um, uh, and I share with, uh, with many of my friends, when I just started work, surprisingly, um, I talked to some re uh, relatively, how to say, um, such successful API community members who have been living in this country for several decades were serving a relatively high ranking position. But when I talk about a census, when I tell them, hey, I changed my job, I start to work on census, they ask me, what is census? And then I explain to them and they will tell me, okay, oh, um, uh, can you do me a favor? Can you talk to the Census Bureau, ask them a favor. I say, what favor? And they say that, can you ask them to add my home address into their list? I have been living in this country for 40 years. I have never received any envelope, any census form from the Census Bureau. And uh, we know it's impossible. It's just because even our community members, even though our community members without language barriers, when they, how to say, they don't have the knowledge to distinguish the 
the envelope from the census to participate in. Then on the top of that, think about we have so many community members have language barrier and yeah, so the, the awareness is very low, but when the time reached to the end of the census, um, the worries change in the community, I can see that. And we may all recall that um, actually this, the deadline of census changed back and forth four times in the last around one month. So at that time, there's another panic in the community, in our community that people really were really worried that they're left out especially for those community members who have the, uh, the language barrier and technology barrier, don't know how to fill out the census on phone or online. They're so worried about that. They missed the deadline. They were not able to fill it out. So at least in the positive way, looking at this is a better problem to have. At least now more our community members know what is census and they know how important to, to, to fill it out and they want to fill it out. Um, yeah, there's a long way to go. Um, I hope after 10 years, the things will be different. Like um, when I was doing the census training, every time, even in the room with 200 people or 500 people from our API community, I always ask who have ever heard of census, who know census. I always ask people to hands up. I barely see more than five hands. Then my next question is always like, who have ever filled out any census in your life in this country? I barely see more than three hands up. I believe the situation will be changed. But as I said that, we have so long way to go. And I feel that civic education is never enough. And the education and support and advocate for census is also never in enough. We need to continue fighting, start from now to prepare for the next census. Thank you. I think they covered it all. I would like to add one more thing to what- Yes, please. To the point where Stephanie is talking about the completion of census and the education part. I do notice that um, a lot of time, especially with the family who are brand new to here, they are very intimidated by the census itself. They don't know what it is. Uh, they're afraid that they might use that information against them. So having to educate them, not only the civic engagement in the classroom, but the fact that outreach in the community, having community meetings and meeting them at their comfort location, help them explain what is the purpose of the census, how the census can actually benefit them as community member instead of hindering them. Um, so, you know, with the heighten of um, ice and everything else and the pandemic when you're talking about census and you know most people are self-isolating um, the census is something that they're, they're not very familiar with we at the school level we push them we educate the children and we also try and get the parents to come in so we can talk to them how important it is to complete the census but uh, I think the number one goal is to teach them at where they are at their level reach out as much as we can Thank you. Thank you for adding that on. Um, and to go off of that a bit, throughout all of your responses, we've talked a bit about the need for education justice for our students and how representation, like having the three of you in positions of power, can move us towards this future. And as we know, schools are incredibly important because they are the key places for the younger generation to learn and grow and develop into our future leaders. We wanted to talk a little bit more about this topic to see how you all perceive the different developments in school um, and the challenges that Asian American students in particular may face. So things like bullying and discrimination in schools, how have these issues worsened with the COVID-19 pandemic? And to your knowledge, are there policies or any sort of uh, movements or work in place to protect Asian American students in these schools? So um, I'm a former public school teacher, certainly a uh, parent of three children, and most of my organizing work has been around education. And there's a tremendous amount that we all have to do right now. There's no question that Asian American youth, um, in addition to Asian American communities, have been deeply impacted by the rise in anti-Asian violence around hate, 
um, if you think that the former president, sitting members of Congress, and major media outlets and platforms spewing and espousing uh, racial slurs, um, conspiracy theories against uh, Asian nations, um, you know, uh, outrageous, uh, you know, language directed towards uh, broader communities. Um, has an impact on like what happened in uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, to what we see uh, in terms of the 200% rise in uh, hate crimes against Asian Americans. It's absolutely going to happen at school. Um, a little over a decade ago, uh, a young a group of Asian immigrant youth led the charge on a federal civil rights uh, case against the school district of Philadelphia for severe violence, bullying, harassment, and assaults that they had received at their school over a long period of time. All of us who are Asian and uh, Asian American, um, Principal Poe, we've definitely spoken about this, um, but I know for, for all of us, uh, and, and, and also for women, but also young boys, um, we have all gone through what bullying and harassment feels like. So there are, there are key things that we can and must do. Um, we do have a policy on the books. Uh, thanks to the you know, tremendous work of young people, young Asian American youth here in Philadelphia uh, more than a decade ago, there is a bullying and, and, and harassment policy. However, just because something's written down in the books doesn't mean that it actually lives. That includes um, not only in a school, but, um, but at Penn. So we should all be reviewing, collectively reviewing, and having young Asian Americans reviewing the harassment policy that is present within a institution, a school district, and then be asking ourselves and training young people to ask ourselves, well, how does it work at a school? Um, it's one thing for it to be written on a website for, for you know, the school district of Philadelphia. It's another thing for the way it looks at Mayfair Elementary School or H.A. Brown Elementary School, Furness, Northeast High, um, Lincoln High School, um, or for, for areas where Asian American youth are absolutely not the majority. More and more what we're seeing is that young people need to take this on themselves. And when they do, um, they actually come with better outcomes, things that are more clear. They share it more widely when they are um, both the authors, the participants, and the drivers. So if we're in a position where we can allot space for young people to weigh in on issues, um, you know, my own daughter, for example, is working on a reporting protocol for harassment um, at her local school because uh, there isn't a clear one. There may be a, a bullying and harassment policy at the school district that prohibits it, but there isn't a way for young people to report um, bullying and harassment at their school, whether they are Asian, whether they are Black, whether they are recent immigrants, whether they are disabled women or LGBTQ. So, um, so I think this is really an important issue. Um, and I think that the, because, because safety and because existence is one of the key aspects of whether a young person even wants to be present at a school, our um, kind of neglect of this area or our presumption, oh, you can handle it or just suck it up, you know, it's, um, is, is not only, um, not only like, uh, irresponsible. It's like actually part of the abusive process. We have a duty and a responsibility right now to ensure the safety, visibility, and protection of Asian American young people in whatever educational institution that we are in. And it will not happen because there's a policy on the books. It will not happen because people will say, well, we would never do that on purpose. It will happen because we neglect to actually enforce it, to make it real. So um, as soon as uh, people are back in person or even right now, it is worthwhile for Penn students, for Furness students, for elementary school students, no matter where people are on the spectrum to review your school's harassment and reporting policies and to make sure that they feel safe, accessible and that they actually lead to change um, when people do report. The second thing I think that we would have to really, you know, take a look at um, 
is around uh, is is continues to be issues of access for for young people. Uh, we are still, uh, you know, Philadelphia of the three major uh, U.S. Northeast cities: Boston, New York, and and Philadelphia. Um, we're the city that has the uh, the least number of people who who self-report as being English proficient. They feel comfortable in English. Um, and this was done uh, on a report um, a while ago with uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice uh, to be able to understand that. But we have not really invested a lot in English language support services, ESL programs, schools, bilingual programs, et cetera. We've walked away from it um, in a large way, both at the school district level as well as the city level. Um, what that means then, though, is that we have to be diligent about um, language access in every single section of our work. And that is, um, once it gets going, it actually feels more natural and normal. But at the beginning, it is a hurdle. It is constant training and retraining. It's checking people, noting when things go wrong, making amends for it, and then going back and re-adhering to it. Um, it means double checking and forcing cross checking, you know, for logs, did you ask how many times did we access language line, how many times was a, a, you know, an interpreter called, how good was the experience for both the student as well as the English speaker in that dynamic. Um, so language access is very important. And then, um, and then I think, you know, the broader areas are from there, you know, people feeling safe people having access, we begin to expand the possibilities for engagement. Um, young people, Asian American young people are, are going to schools right now that are on average over 70 years old. Uh, you know, we have had situations of young people breathing in lead, asbestos and mold. Uh, Mr. Poe should do a photograph of uh, his school's um, auditorium, which is, you know, architecturally speaking, phenomenal and beautiful. And in reality, completely unusable in the balcony areas because of the dust and, and other things that are going there. No child should be denied an experience because their building is completely unfit for habitation. But that's the reality of many, many uh, students in our school system. And so we really have to be active around um, making sure that our buildings are functioning. And then of course, uh, continuing to support and work on the diversification of staff, expansion of uh, ethnic studies programs. And, and here is where Penn um, and Penn students can really lead the charge because if Penn models um, a robust ethnic studies program, then, you know, in fact, the district can also be supportive of that. Maybe at some point, uh, high school students at Furness can attend some of those ethnic studies programs as if they're not currently offered within the school district of Philadelphia. So I hope that we can see that there's an interplay between um, Penn students' experiences um, because they're so close to our, to our younger, to our young people, much closer than Ms. Principal Poe and Stephanie and I are uh, to them right now. Um, but, you know, uh, but hopefully that shows that we, we have a lot that we can do to support young people and especially Asian American youth, young people's experiences in education. I'd like to add a little bit more to Councilwoman Kim's uh, statement, uh, all true, of course, wonderful uh, statement. Um, I think I'm going back to um, representation and education. When, when we're talking about bullying, having someone that they, most of our students who are either new or who have been in this country for a long time, uh, when they get bullied, they tend to keep it to themselves. They don't report it. We know there's a policy, we enforce the policy, but getting them to speak and to report that to us so we can handle it. Um, but having representation in a, at, at their level where students speak out and say, you know what, if you've been bullied, you need to come out, you need to tell us how, who, what, when, where, and why, how we can fix that. Um, educating them to speak out, speak up, let them know it's not just because you're being bullied, that doesn't mean it's your fault. It has nothing to do with you, it's the perpetrator um, invading your, your space. So you need to speak up. So this way the future would stop 
not only to stop you from getting bullied, but stop other people from getting bullied. So education, uh, educating them to, to step up, to speak out, and uh, happy representation um, who, who are that they can relate to at their, um, maybe having student group talking about um, bullying policy reviewing at the district level. Great. Um, Stephanie, do you want to add on? Oh, perfect. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add because so well said by two panelists. Uh, yes, I strongly agree with that. Everything they said. Um, since the MC also asked about like how the situation of bullying and discrimination in schools have worsened with the COVID-19. So I would like to share um, some examples that occurred in different regions in Pennsylvania. We have heard of incidents of bullying and discrimination in schools um, um, happen in other states and also in Pennsylvania, unfortunately. We heard from the community about the incidents of both physical violence and verbal abuse. This includes threatened statement of badly, uh, of badly uh, harm against Asian American students by classmates at a high school in Lower Moreland Township, Montgomery County. In Central PA, just on the same day as the uh, terrible murders in Georgia, a Korean American student was subject to racist abuse in, um, in the community in, in the parking lot. Um, she reported that uh, in a parking lot, a middle-aged white woman yelled racial slurs and made offensive hand gesture, including putting back the skin around her eyes to imitate typical East Asian eye shapes. We're looking into this and working on this now. And in Western PA, some discrimination incidents also happened in schools in Pittsburgh area. And we know there are many more than this being reported, happened on the ground. Um, but one thing I also want to add is uh, the incidents of bullying and discrimination against Asian Pacific American students do not only happen or impact them only in school, and or campus, but also on their way to school and in their everyday life. This happened um, when Asian students walk on the street. Uh, this also happened when Asian students were waiting in line in front of grocery stores and happened in the train, maybe on their way to school, uh, when some people verbally and violently threatened them and forced them to get off the train. This happened last year in Philadelphia. And, and it's attacked uh, an Asian students and, in, and actually an international student. So now many regions were working on returning to school as we know. In some regions, Asian American students and their families have been hesitated hesitation and concern about the safety of returning to school and on the way to school. And we have seen on some news that in some regions, the school reached reopen, the Asian American students' attendances declined a lot and are disproportionately low. What is the reason? I think we know that. And schools are supposed to be the second homes of students in my eyes, in my heart. And school is supposed to be the harbors to make students feel safe and feel being loved, be valued, be protected and supported. The schools are the hub of the society because it connects the students and the working family. It connects the their, uh, it connect our our present and also our future. So how can we make the school the way it should be? Is a question that. I think we should ask ourselves and all work together. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for all of those incredibly thorough and thought provoking answers. Um, as a heads up to everyone, this will be our last question for the panelists. So please feel free to type more questions in the chat or after this, raise your hand if you would like to ask something. Um, 
But our final question is, what factors do you consider most important when evaluating potential policy items regarding the Asian American community? So in addition to all of these bilingual education policies and the anti-harassment policies we've talked about, there's also a lot of movement around pilots and the tax abatement. Are there other policies and organizing that you're strongly in favor of right now? If I can go first, um, I think policy items that, um, that affect Asian American community are not all necessarily target directly at the Asian Pacific American community. Even it can be without any word mentioned about the name of our community. So any policy, uh, any policy item need to be valued for its impact on the community, on the Asian Pacific uh, American community to see it as positive or negative. And policy items, in particular legislative agenda items, which I am strongly in support of, include passing the Pennsylvania Fairness Act to protect all people, regardless of age, disability, and, and century, and color of uh, skin, uh, color of skin, and uh, national region, race, religion, sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Um, this has been 65 years since Pennsylvania's law protecting people from discrimination has been updated, and it is far overdue. In addition, um, there are also uh, red legislative items which I believe all of us should oppose, in particular items which would make it more difficult to vote. Pennsylvania state lawmakers have already introduced 14 restrictive voting measures, including measures to make it more difficult to vote by mail. Any type of restriction voting legislation disproportionately affect minority community, especially AAPI community with all the unique um, barriers even uh, harder, how to say, impact us even more than other minority community. So that's why, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And I absolutely underscore uh, the importance of the AAPI community being involved with the, with the, you know, an expansion of the hate crimes law and the, um, you know, and, and the, uh, you know, recognition of sexual orientation in particular um, within Pennsylvania law. And then, um, of course, voting rights and um, uh, support for that. I also wanted to add in a few more. Um, there's no question, I, I, you know, especially I think uh, given what happened in Georgia, um, there are broader things in play that we have to get active around just beyond uh, and recognize um, that that goes beyond our our own world. Um, one, I think we we absolutely need to pass immigration reform. Um, this is an extremely, extremely important issue. The Biden administration is willing to move yet again. Uh, well, is willing to cut apart pieces of the immigration law, which would separate out, for example, DACA, protect TPS, um, and certain sectors. But it largely will not deal with the bigger problem that we have, which is we have too many people who are in the shadows. Many of them are Asian American. Um, this week alone, 33 Vietnamese uh individuals who came here uh, were forced here actually because of uh, because of uh, America's involvement in in war uh, throughout Asia during the Vietnam War era. Uh, these Viet Vietnam War era individuals um, were deported. Um, th three dozen of them uh, were deported, sent to Texas and flew out on a plane. That is devastating for many communities, um, especially re refugees, um, who came here because of America's war uh, wars in Asia. And um, if we do not uh, get very visible, very vocal about our um, presence and our benefits within the immigration laws, then we risk losing our own people at the altar of those who foment hate against many brown folks, against 
Latinos, um, other people of color, uh, it is absolutely responsible for us to be part of and a visible, visible part of uh, the work around immigration reform. Um, I think we also need to talk about uh, raising the minimum wage. Um, what happened in uh, Georgia impacted not only the AAPI community, but a particular sector of the AAPI community, women who are in largely low wage work, um, and we need to raise and strengthen labor laws that protect uh, immigrants, that protect women in particular, and protect Asian Americans. They are very, very vulnerable um, in low wage work. And so Pennsylvania has the lowest minimum wage of any surrounding state. We're at $7.25 an hour. Every single state around us has a higher minimum wage. Um, you know, we're at $2.13 if you get tipped. Um, and so that is, those are criminally low wages. It keeps people down. It exploits um, workers who then go off the books because they'll go below that. Um, so it's even more important for us to be visible, vocal, and active in the movement for labor justice, for raising wages, um, for outreach and protections for example, of uh, industries, including uh, sex workers and others, domestic workers, many people who face sexual harassment, assaults, and violence um, against them uh, as, as immigrant and as young or as Asian women. Um, so that's, that's extremely important to me. And then finally, I think we need to be involved um, with, the, with the efforts to reform policing. Um, you know, it does alarm me that this very violent individual um, went and frequented these establishments. He was considered himself a regular customer. Um, and I cannot imagine being a woman who had worked there and seen that individual walk through the doors, whether they felt safe, whether the, if they didn't feel safe, if they felt safe that they could call the police and that actually if they did, they would get help rather than that they themselves might be criminalized. They themselves might worry about their own children or their own livelihoods or families. And so, you know, they're uh, in a state where um, a 19 year old uh, Asian American adoptee named Christian Hall uh, was shot to death by state troopers because he was having a mental health episode. Um, you know, in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, uh, la late last year, it is important for us to recognize that um, that that our presence means that we have to be active in protections for young people, and that does not just mean um, policing, but a better form of engagement around uh, criminal justice, around policing, um, and all of that. So I would add, uh, uh, you know. Um, both immigration reform, labor protections, and uh, a real movement for criminal justice reform as being part of our mission and part of our presence here as an expanding, more active, more civically engaged Asian American uh, population. I would actually agree with both uh, my co-panelists. Um, they've spoken so eloquently. I don't think I have much more to add to that. Thank you for sharing that. Great. Thank you so, so much, all of you, for sharing your thoughts about these impactful policy items. These were really, really powerful words, and this has been really inspiring and, and energizing, at least for me, to hear about. So I think you all provided such a comprehensive description of these systems and their issues, so I really appreciate your thoughtfulness. So at this time, we want to open up the floor to our audience members. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat and we can read it out. Or if you would like to, you can use the raise hand function and we can call on you to ask the question out loud. But yeah. Oh, I actually got a question in the chat. Um, great, so unless I'm, I hope I'm not missing anyone, but 
The question they asked is, at the individual level, what can be done to help address these issues? So at the individual level was asked? Yeah, I think because um, if I might elaborate or like my interpretation of this question is that um, a lot of us are students and we do feel like an urge to be more involved, to become more active and a call to action. So just on the individual level. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a number of things. Uh, I'm actually just writing a little piece about that very same thing. You know, it starts with um, some easy stuff, uh, you know, certainly supporting local advocacy organizations run by Asian American leadership whose mission that you really believe in. And I talked a little bit about how Philadelphia is home to a real diverse and variety of organizations. I come up through a group that, um, you know, like, for example, with Asian Americans United, Viet Lead, um, uh, you know, um, and some other organizations, Cambodian Association of Greater Philadelphia, uh, you know, One Love Movement um, that, that fights deportations in Philadelphia that's been really active. Um, you know, there can be like more political groups like APIPA that's working for civic engagement statewide. Um, there are organizations that are, are led by Asian Americans um, you know, such as the Philadelphia Student Union um, uh, and other types of groups. But, you know, the most important thing is, is that there are local advocacy organizations. You can support them. You can donate. Um, that's a very easy thing that people can do right now um, that you can volunteer and get to know them a little bit better. But either way, you know, we should be working to support things. Um, of course, if we witness any kind of anti-Asian violence, um, we should be reporting it, not necessarily to the police, though, like you could report it to the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations to make sure that it's being tracked. Um, there's a national clearinghouse called Stop AAPI Hate, where it can be reported. And of course, if you witness like serious violence, you should absolutely report it to the police and then learn how to be supportive, consoling, like offering solidarity and support, help a friendly word so that the last person, uh, you know, um, that, you know, uh, you know, that a victim would leave a place of like violence from is the last word that they might hear might be the kindest one um, from all of you. I hope that we learn to do a couple of things, right? Like there are areas where right now we should be particularly um, cognizant. We should learn how to protect women and low wage workers against gendered hate and violence. That can be groups on campus. Um, it means that we have to apply ourselves to really learn how to get better at language to do it but we have to be active in that right now. We have to protect students in schools. And I kind of talked about a few basic ways, make sure that there's harassment and policy in place, make sure that young people know how to use that harassment policy, make sure that there's a reporting protocol so that even if there's a policy, somebody actually, actually has to execute on that policy. We should be protecting sex workers. We should be protecting uh, people who are, are in fields that I think the Asian American community has uh, been complicit in um, marginalizing or turning their backs on or not discussing. Um, we have to be active around groups like Red Umbrella Alliance, which is a mutual aid group for, for sex workers. Black Brown Workers Collective, which has been protesting uh, violence against uh, you know, LGBT trans, trans individuals and sex workers as well. Um, and then we should teach ourselves uh, how to do better, you know, like um, what recognize why police, when people say that policing is not always the answer, we should be having words and language in our vocabulary about why policing may not always be the answer for very vulnerable groups, especially if you're undocumented, especially if you're in a field of work that isn't um, considered you know, um, valued by the larger public, especially if you feel vulnerable um, about whether your language will be appreciated. Secondly, we should be working to support Philadelphians overall who are working to be active and bridging uh, issues of race relations. You know, there's, a, you know, on in my world, you know, there are broader civic organizations like Power, there's a group called the Movement Alliance Project, but also at Penn, 
Um, there are organizations that are consistently working to support and expand our capacity for race relations. And so if you had the ability uh, you know, to do that and you feel like that's part of the mission, um, you know, uh, that is one, one thing you can do. And then finally, at the very least, you know, show up for the protests as, as you know, 100 people did two nights ago in the vigil for Atlanta. You will learn about more people. Um, you, can you can learn how to, you know, get better language. You will find groups and others um, that, that, you know, you can be in touch with. You can learn how to check your friends, um, your colleagues, those awkward conversations that happen when someone's dismissive or mocking or, you know, cruel or participatory. Um, we have to teach ourselves how not to be complicit. And uh, that takes some work. Um, it takes some practice you know, no one gets good at it the first time. The first time is terribly awkward and you kick yourself afterwards um, and then you get better and you get better and you meet more people and you remind yourselves why we have to be more humane and loving and expansive and purposeful in our pursuit of justice than ever before and not feel smaller about it. Thank you so much, Council Member is so well said, thank you. Um, since the MC said that majority of our audience today are students, I just try to push, uh, put myself in the shoes, try to think about what I want to say to Stephanie, if I can meet the Stephanie who was like 20 years or 10 years younger than the current myself. And I want to say to myself and also uh, share with you that I will say that, uh, try to uh, find the opportunity and spend time um, volunteering, interning, uh, do the inter doing the internship to um, to work with the community um, through the past, maybe uh, through nonprofit organizations or some government agencies, or just work together with student group or grassroots community groups. And through this, I think um, you can better understand the community and better understand how the society, how the system works. And this also, I think, will be helpful to shape our mindset and our view of the world. And it may also provide the opportunity to experience the work in public sector. Uh, you may find the passion or interesting for future career, which you never realized in yourself before. Um, like, to be honest, I never imagined I would work in the government in this country before, but my experience, uh, especially my experience of working with the grassroots uh, community did change my mind and shape my career path. And so spending time on experiencing and considering diverse career paths we hope to see an increase of um, Asian Pacific American participation in the public sector. We need more Asian Pacific American in this field to serve and to advocate for our community and for all the vulnerable community. And even if you still choose another career path in the private sector, still try to cultivate a habit of always being involved in the community and the public sector. There are many different paths and many different roles in front of us. And you can address these issues no matter what career path you choose. Many of uh, my commissioners actually uh, spent their whole life with a daytime job in the private sector, but they also spent their time through their whole life serving the community and even advising the, the, the governor, advising the administration, serving on our commission. So we need more people um, on both sides, inside the system and outside the system. Then we can work together through different approach to address these issues. And more than anything, I think, is always get involved, get involved and, and voice out for yourself and for your 
for your community, for the people who you care and love. A society and a government is made of people. Without people, neither a society or a government can function. So more than anything, we all need to work together to build a better society and better system together. Thank you. That is wonderful. Uh, both ladies have touched on so many uh, wonderful points about how you get involved. And I fully agree with that. The other thing uh, I would add to that is to become role model, become mentor, reach out to student, to children at the school level, neighborhood school, um, see what program they have. Those are the mind that are just starting to expand. They need someone to mentor them, someone they can look up to, someone who they can talk to. Um, you don't know how much impact you can you can reach to individual students, especially at a younger age, at the uh, middle school and the high school level. Uh, find out what program they have at the school. Get involved. Um, they, they, you know, at, at the high school level, children are looking to go to college. And, you know, what they hear most is they hear from principal like myself, you got to go to college, you got to go, you got to work hard, you got to go to college. Then you have counselor who goes, well, you got to do your work, do, you have to work hard to get your PSAT. You have to work hard on your SAT. And um, it's not too motivating. But if you hear someone at their age uh, group uh, who are experienced college already um, coming out there, telling them this is what college life is like. There's excitement. There's hard work involved. But guess what? You can do this and uh, become that mentor. Um, and you, you don't know how much. Um, that can change. As I've said, I came into the education 25 years ago by accident. I volunteered at the school with a degree in business. I hated business, so I became a teacher. And then I became a principal. And um, I don't know what the next step for me might be. Uh, maybe I become the assistant to Helen Gim. Who knows? Um, or I'll work for Stephanie. But in any case, become that role model and uh, you know, show your passion. Share that with the, uh, the younger crowd, the younger group. So this way they can grab onto you and they can pick your brain and um, they can move at the direction that we, the adult, may not know or have lost contact with. And that's all. Great, thank you so, so much. Those very thoughtful responses. Um, we only have about nine minutes left since we're wrapping up the panel portion um, at like 2.30. So and we have a few questions. Um, so we just wanted to see, maybe we can like wrap up these questions into one question or something like that and ask it as like a final one. Um, but in the chat, Nilu wrote, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. My question is, how would you describe the relationship between politicians and grassroots movements? How do these groups converse and inform one another to create effective policy? And the other question, I think Sally's question was sort of addressed already just by Dan right now and by, um, by Council Member Gim in the chat. The other question by Sophie asks about, um, sorry, I'm trying to find it. Okay, uh, going through Chinatown in South Philly, I have noticed a rising homeless population of Asian Americans. How do we as students, Philadelphians and leaders address the serious issue of homelessness in this city, particularly with how racism impacts homeless individuals? So maybe if you wanted to just pick one of those questions and, and respond to it, um, I think that would be great. Yeah, I can start with maybe uh, the first question you asked, Chelsea, and a little bit of what Tiffany, I think, put into the chat. Um, you know, first of all, there is no one way in which uh, political actors and organizations operate. Um, it's a practice. It's not, it's not a theory. Now, I have a theory about it. You know, I believe, for me, that um, my power does not come from my position. My power comes from the ability of external organizations, community organizing groups, and people themselves to make political actors who are otherwise reluctant 
force them to take action on issues that have long been neglected, marginalized, or ignored. Um, and so, you know, the, this, this is a, this, you know, one of the things that I love about local politics, as opposed to like, you know, just politics writ large, is that it looks different at different levels, in addition to different people. Um, as a local elected, I am very close to my community. I'm not traveling back and forth to Harrisburg or to Washington, D.C. Um, I'm not meddling around with like hundreds and hundreds of like legislators trying to, you know, get a law together. I've got 17 people on my city council body in my own city. And because of that, I feel very um, both, I feel very invested in uh, in the organizing in the community powers external to my city hall, because I know they can transform. I know that they can influence. And I know when um, hundreds of people come into a room, make phone calls and tell you that they're watching, that it's impossible for political actors to just like ignore you. Um, and uh, most of my work has been around teaching people how not to be ignored. And it doesn't mean you have to be the loudest in the room. You do have to know how to exercise your own voice and visibility in ways that can be both seen and heard. Um, and, you know, like there is, you know, to Tiffany's point, there's, there is pushback. Of course, there's pushback. I wouldn't be here if there weren't pushback, you know, so like, and if you don't get pushback, um, it's, it's either because you're really like mowing it all down and you're completely, you know, the power structure itself, um, or you're not being bold enough. I mean, I said earlier that my presence on here should fundamentally alter the kinds of things we talk about, the people who actually benefit, the reallocations of our budgets, the type of laws that we pass. And then most importantly, it's not about me being in power. It's about my presence making, uh, Asian Americans, making people of color, making people who are struggling for, you know, uh, housing and labor rights and immigrant rights and educational rights more powerful than they've ever been. Not me being mo most powerful, but if they're more powerful, then we together become a vehicle. I don't think that that's a common way of practicing politics. It's just not. Philadelphia is one of the largest and last machine politics city. It's us and Chicago. But it's also a, a place where every election, we have a chance to rewrite something different. So, um, you know, so if you're wondering about it, um, you're not waiting for something to happen. I'm not, you know, like, you know, a unicorn or something particularly special. I'm someone who's trying to figure it out with a lot of other organizing groups and others who are trying to figure it out in this moment. Not like we already had it planned out. There's a roadmap. We already know where we're going. Absolutely not. Anything can upend anything. And so um, we, we stay close to one another. We stay close to, um, close to our communities. Um, we keep mobilizing. We keep adapting. And, um, and, and if you want your politics to look like that, then you should also get involved in electing people who feel like that's what you want, you know, as opposed to kind of what I think older generations might have had, which is you, we elected you, you go be our voice, um, come back to us in three years and we'll see how you've done. Now I think the dynamic is very, very much more engaged and active and each law is a, you know, each campaign for a law is a new step towards something else. Each budget means we've advanced visions of a better form of policing, more money for education and housing, you know, less money into the pockets of the richest, wealthiest, most privileged people in our city. Um, so it's a process. Uh, it's not a person. It's not, you know, just a theory. If it's a theory, it has to be practiced. If it's a person, it actually has to be like lived and held accountable to. And if that means it's all of us, I hope that makes it feel like people who are watching, um, who are, you know, if you're 18 or if you're 24 or if you're 40, you can feel like there's a place for you in this work. Great. Um, Principal Power, Stephanie, did you want to tackle any of these questions? I actually yeah. um, just touch on a little bit on that. Thinking about what 
Councilwoman Kim just said, building the community power um, within the school. Uh, as you know, I'm working at the school level, so I don't have the political power anywhere. Uh, but the fact that the matter is working with grassroots organization, uh, building that relationship, building that strong relationship with the community uh, grassroots organization based on what the community need and just continue to push for that. Um, strength is in number as long as we are working as a team. Um, we can push the agenda through. Uh, I don't have to be a politician. If I need something that I know that the community needs, I can always push it to Stephanie or push it to Helen. And, uh, you know, we would share the idea. But having that um, open dialogue with the community members, with the community and what and assessing the, um, the needs of the community, continue pushing for that. So, so that would be uh, what I would add to. Okay, I see we only have um, very limited time. I just want to add a little bit like how I, um, how I see this. I like, I strongly agree with everything um, my colleague panelists just shared. We were well say, thank you so much. And I also feel that the politicians and the grassroots uh, movement, they're not necessarily to separate components and or unique groups, they're together. And they're really more of like, like a continuum with some politicians entry politics through their work, through the grassroots organizations. That being said, all politicians and all grassroots organizations are different with different perspectives, ideals and goals, but like many groups, they will cooperate and collaborate work together um, based on their common goals. And these groups, they converse and inform each other continuously, either directly as politicians and, and uh, constituents or directly through the common rela re relations and trust or through groups like uh, our, uh, our commission who has members from grassroots community and members with contacts in the grassroots community and members uh, within the political sphere. So our commission, the Governor's Advisory Commission on Asian Pacific and American Affairs was, exact, uh, was established by the executive order in 2015 and is dedicated to ensure that the Commonwealth government is accessible, accountable to the diverse Asian Pacific American community in Pennsylvania. As such, we try to act as a bridge to uh, between the bridge between the grassroots community and the, and the administration to bring together those who need to all both on the table, all on the table to develop an effective policy together. Thank you. Great. So I think those are the questions. And um, yeah, just thank you all so much for taking the time and for really giving so much care to each answer. I think we all learned so much today and individually. Thank you, Councilmember Gim, for your super articulate expertise and dedication to our staying in our local community. Um, Ms. Sun, for your bridging of organizations and the broader community to the local government, and for your advice to younger Stephanie, um, and Principal Poe for your passion to educate, uh, to pursuing education justice for so many students as we've seen today. Um, so if anyone needs to leave of our panelists, Definitely understand, I'm sure you are on busy schedules, but we also wanted to share some updates. So uh, I think first we can go and explain the Furness fundraiser. Principal Poe, if you wanna explain that a little bit. Well, thank you for that. Um, what we have done was uh, uh, any money for graduation, we were not able to do fundraising. And so we have worked closely with our um, vendor to offset the cost for the um, the graduation package the senior do. Uh, normally we charge between $150 to $200. Um, this year we decided, you know what, we need to cut down a lot of things just for them to have something to remember us by. Um, what they, we decided to give them um, yearbook 
for this year, uh, the cap, the gown, uh, the tassel, and the class t-shirt that comes down to $75 per student at cost. We make no profit from that. And as we propose that to the seniors, I noticed we have 140 seniors and fewer than 50% of them could afford it. So because of the fact that they've lost every privilege there was for this year, there was no senior lunch, senior trip, senior anything. I said, I'm going to try to raise up enough money to pay for those who cannot afford it. Um, I think what I've also done is I'm, I'm pushing it to trying to raise it so I can cover all the 140 students, whoever pay would get their money back. So if you are, you're interested in um, supporting a senior or sponsoring a senior is $75. I'll go to a graduation for a senior at Furness High School. Great, and that information um, has been posted in the chat and we'll also make that information available, I think on the ASM website for anyone um, to look more into it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, and Josie, if you wanted to explain um, the Pilot's Day of Action. Yes, definitely. Um, so to put together this event, we have, we have an upcoming email blast activity later after this, but it's to help support um, all this movement that's going around going on around pilots. So we've been working with Jobs with Justice to raise awareness for this event that's coming up soon. It's going to be on March 30th. And essentially they're planning to hold a march from the construction sites on Penn's campus all the way through Drexel's campus to call for these nonprofit institutions to pay pilots. So we've heard a lot today about the importance of education justice and how we need to be um, contributing more to, to these schools and um, I think that if you want to get involved and take part in direct action, this is a great way to do that. They're going to be holding up signs and just raising a lot of awareness and making a lot of noise around this. So I can post the information about the Facebook event and um, in the chat in case you are interested and want to share it with others that you know. Um, yeah, um, and we would love to say that our... You know, you know, we'd love to see you continue to stay for the event that we have planned after, which is that email blast that Josie mentioned. Um, but before we do that, we'd also like to plug the next ASM Fellows event next week, as well as to let you all know that ASM Fellowship apps are open. So if you want to be involved with this incredible program next year, we truly encourage you to apply. Um, but some more information about the event next week is that it'll be moderated by Erin O'Malley and Claire Wynn, to ASM Fellows on Friday, March 26th at 1.30 p.m. It's called the Alien Asian slash the Asian Alien, which is a panel discussion with scholars, artists, and immigrant rights organizers to more critically examine the intersection of art and activism, specifically in relation to anti-carceral organizing in the vast Asian American community. So it'll be an incredible time and we encourage you all to show up. Um, but Jill C will right now explain the next activity we have planned. <laughs> 